Thank you, Brother Baker. Hebrews chapter number 10 tonight. Hebrews chapter number 10. It's good to have our guest here tonight, Andres. And I uh, met him yesterday out at Ace Hardware and got a propane tank. He filled it up and gave a track and, and came this evening from Venezuela. He's uh, been working on his English for a couple years. And he's doing better on his English than I am on my Spanish, so he's ahead of the game. But we're glad you're here tonight and uh, I'm very, very uh, thankful for uh, just the, the power of the tracks, the tracks that are given out. And so if you know any Spanish, you want to get to Andres tonight and, and uh, tell him, hola. <laughs> Por favor, el baño. That is the phrase that will go down on my tombstone as the, as the most coveted Spanish phrase of my life. It's what got me out of Spanish 2 class more than anything else. Um, and so she passed me. <laughs> when God called me to preach, I went off to Bible college and uh, Lord did a lot of things in my life and had to make a trip back to that public high school and Make some apologies to some teachers, uh, and um, but I remember she was one of them, and so. But I still let her know I knew poor favor Albano, and she was still proud of me. I think. And Hebrews chapter number ten, we have it. Now stand together, please. We're going to look at verse number nineteen. Beginning in verse 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Look at verse 24 again and read it with me out loud. Verse 24 together. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Tonight I want to preach on the thought of consider one another. Consider one another. Thank you. Please be seated. The writer begins by saying three things about Jesus that we've just read. Number one, he is the living way to the very presence of God. We enter into the presence of God by means of the veil, he says. Um, by verse 20, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil. The veil that is by the flesh of Jesus. That is a difficult thought, but what he means is this, in front of the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle, there hung the veil to screen off the presence of God. For anyone to enter into that presence, the veil would have to be torn apart. Well, what he's telling us is that Jesus, his flesh is what veiled his Godhead. Charles Wesley in that great Christmas hymn wrote, Hark the herald angels sing. And he made this appeal, veiled in flesh, the Godhead see. It was when the flesh of Christ was torn upon the cross that people could really see God. See God in the sense of entering into a relationship with him as had not been experienced before. So as the tearing of the tabernacle veil opened the way to the presence of God, so the tearing of the flesh of Christ revealed the full greatness of his love and opened up the way to him. Then he tells us in verse number 21, and having an high priest over the house of God. 
He tells us that not only is Jesus the living way to the presence of God, he's also the high priest over God's house in the heavens. See, the function of the high priest was to build a bridge between the people and God. And this means that Jesus not only shows us the way to God, but he is also our way to God. Someone might be able to direct a tourist who asked the way to Buckingham Palace and yet be very far from having the right to take that person into the very presence to see the king or queen. But Jesus, however, can take us all the way in, the whole way in. That's a great place to say amen. If you've not said amen, I'm beginning to wonder if I need to preach a gospel message if, if that didn't do something to you. Um, Jesus is the high priest over God's house in the heavens. Jesus, a third thing he says is he's the one person who can really cleanse. In verse number 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Jesus is the one person and only person who can truly cleanse us. So our need, our need is really to experience Jesus. It really is. It's to experience all that he is and all that he has. And in light of these three things about Jesus, he urges us to do three things. In verse number 22, he says, let us draw near. In verse number 23, he says, let us hold fast. And in verse 24, he says, let us consider one another. And so tonight, I want us to focus on that third exhortation. And it's the final exhortation of this particular passage. And that is to mutually consider one another. And it extends down into verse 25, which is actually a participle phrase that carries on the thought of verse 24. So we often will quote verse 25, but it's coupled with verse 24. He says, consider, consider. It speaks of an attentive, continuous care. This is to take careful note of each other's spiritual welfare. The purpose of this attentive, continuous care is to provoke each other to exercise and to the exercise of love and, to, and of good works. Kenneth Wiest in his uh, translation of the Greek grammar here, he says, uh, verse 24, and let us constantly be giving careful attention to one another for the purpose of stimulating one another to divine and self-sacrificial love and good works. It sounds like a good church, doesn't it? It is if it abides by these three exhortations. And this is done in the atmosphere of an assembly. It's a worship-filled assembly. This is what going to meetings should look like. The exhortation, it takes the form of encouragement and comfort, warning, or strengthening. It's the culture of what a church ought to look like. In the business world, in the sports world, in any kind of a world that desires to succeed is the design of having a culture. Many of you are familiar with Peter Drucker, who is a, was a business leader, and he pointed out that culture... Culture eats strategy for breakfast. And the point is, no matter how well you can strategize and organize, if you don't have a culture that is built upon leadership and a culture that will stimulate no amount of organization and tactical structure is going to succeed and thrive. You must have a culture, a culture that has a vision and casts a vision, a culture in which people can experience the equipping in order to do what they've been called to do. That's the business realm. That's the sports realm. But God is telling us that too is the church realm. 
He says a culture ought to be a culture that is genuine Christianity. It was Jesus who said, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. What is that? That they would be known by. What's the badge? Love for one another. See, having the wrong culture, it undermines the very best laid strategy and organizational development. And we can have all the strategies of a church. And we can have all the pomp and circumstance. And we can have all the perks that come with having uh, a, a, a well-established church. But if we don't have the basics of the culture of Christianity, of the Lord Jesus himself... What we have is nothing more than just a business model. We just have a country club gathering. I want us to see tonight that a culture of considering one another is only as effective. If we're going to be really developing a culture of us participating, and this to me comes from tonight. Um, tying into what Peter's talking about this morning. And so in my mind, I'm just seeing it, it's all throughout the New Testament. And, and I can easily just gloss over. It's, it's, I'm sure you don't struggle with this, but I just find more and more I can gloss over a lot of what God says, and I don't want to gloss over. But what we saw this morning is emphasized all throughout and we need to understand that this is not this is not this is not just good ideas this is the culture of new testament christianity and if we're going to have a culture of considering one another then that culture of considering one another is only as effective as your intimacy with god it's only going to be as effective as your intimacy with God. Maybe then. Maybe that's why there were some that seemed to just have a frigid coldness when it comes to... You no, know, there are some that are good at provoking, but not to love and to good works. Maybe it's because there's an absence of intimacy with God. They, they, sometimes there's a, a putting off in such a way, it's like, it's like they just, they, they haven't been alone with Jesus for a while. It's like they've been kissing their mother-in-law. It just seems to be something that's not right. Some of you are beginning to wonder, I don't know, is that? What we need is what Henry Blackaby says is fresh encounters still with God. The deepest need of the human heart is to encounter God. Every one of us have many needs, so many needs, physical Emotional. If we just take prayer requests, physical will come up. We all have physical needs. We all have emotional needs. We all have financial needs. And it's all throughout. But the greatest need any of us have are spiritual needs. But they often don't come up because we're not inclined to stay focused on what God's focused on. And that is the spiritual climate. Spiritual needs. And when it comes to spiritual needs, only God himself can meet those needs. Some have had joy and have lost their joy. They've got a leaky bucket and we need to figure out when we've lost that joy and get back to the one who cannot lose that joy and get that joy from the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. And what we need is in addition to good, sound information about God in Scripture is a good, solid, fresh encounter with the God of Scripture. That's what I need. We need to move from an encounter with a principle or a doctrine or whatever our diet of Bible application might be and move into an experience with the living God who is a person. Just as in Bible times, being in the presence of the living God is an awesome experience. To stand before him is to stand before the one who created the universe with only the sound of his voice. 
Meeting with God is life changing. Everyday encounters are to be part of his plan. No one, and I mean no one, can ever leave his presence and remain the same. Here's what happens to many. We get hung up on our diet. Diet of what I can and can't do. And we define our Christianity and many churches are known based upon what they can or can't do. God is all about initiating encounters with us, not in order just to give us warm devotional thoughts, but He's wanting to forever change us. And as He reveals His will to us, we are compelled to adjust our lives to His activity and join Him in His work. This is so very vital. If we desire to consider one another, we must desperately understand this. We live surrounded by values and standards and viewpoints that are contrary to Scripture that leave us disoriented to a holy God. And here we are coming into an election year and already there are the the spin cycles taking place and the political pundits who get paid more in one talk than we will get paid in a year's time or a couple years and they're telling us what to think. Listen, we don't, we're, there, there are, there's more preaching going on in those segments on TV and the radio and other news facets, more preaching going on than what takes place in our lives on a weekly basis if you count Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And so I make no apology for preaching because we've been given the authority by which to preach. It is God's Word. But they're telling us what to think. When what we're trying to do by the authority of God's word is tell us how to think. And how to think is far more important so that we'll understand why we're here and what this is all about. Every time we open God's word, every time we come before God, we have an opportunity to experience a dramatic life-changing encounter with the living God that can shake us and change our thinking. This is why we need fresh encounters with God. This is why we must seek such encounters. We must approach God's word with hearts that are willing to obey whatever God tells us to do. When we reverently and expectantly approach the scriptures, God's ready to speak life-transforming words to us. And we will never be the same. So... If we're going to have a culture of considering one another, first of all, we must understand we are only as effective as our intimacy with God. A second thought in our culture of considering one another is that this culture of considering one another is wrapped up in our identity. It's wrapped up in our identity. See, the Lord dealt with me about this because of trying to understand at times where aspects of Bible truth fit into my life. The question I have is, what are you living for? Are you living for a title or fulfilling the identity that God has given I've said before, too often people will surrender. They'll surrender to something. Surrender to preach. Surrender to missions. Surrender to pastoring. But many times people may surrender to something and they still are not yet surrendered to someone. Jesus. So that when someone gets into that position with those titles... And God steps in and he makes a change. Sometimes people get so bent out of shape that they have actually quit following Jesus altogether. If God wants to change our plans, don't you think he has the right to do so? But the problem is we're surrendered to something, but we're not surrendered to the someone. Surrender to Jesus. James chapter 1 verse 1, James introduces himself, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's a servant. He's a slave. 
Think about the writers of the New Testament that we preach from, quote, that we admire. What were they? They were servants of the Most High. They were slaves. They were bond slaves to Him. And so my identity is that of a servant. My activity is that of serving. Are you about serving or being served? Servanthood means that all I have and all I am are placed at God's disposal and all that I have and all that I am are placed at your disposal if they will bring you into the presence of God. See, by being a servant, it means all that I have and all that I am is going to be placed at your disposal in order to bring you into the presence of God. See, servanthood is not about how I add value to my life, but how I can add value to yours. The world asks how many people work for you. The Lord is asking, for how many people do you work? Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. And to give His life a ransom for many. I've said before, when I traveled leading the evangelistic group back in the early years of evangelism, we'd have a group travel with us with Minutemen. And there was that Mark 10, 45 that they would memorize. Because many times when you're staying in a home and they put you in and, or put you in a, in a prophet's chamber in a church that nobody has ever stayed in who is a member of that church and only guest on the outside and so no one ever gives them feedback. And, or they put you in a home that the pastor himself has never been over to. And, and, and there are things that, that you recognize this is not really conducive for enjoying this week. And sometimes we let the team members know you're going to be tempted when you get together to want to talk about just how bad it is. And sometimes it can get pretty bad. I mean, I'm not saying as bad as John the Baptist. I didn't lose my head and I lost my testimony a time or two, but not my head. And it wasn't like Paul there awaiting execution, so it wasn't that bad. I remember one time a pastor put us in a, a home. He said a, a family wants to, wants to uh, house you. And this was before the days of our RV. And this was partly what motivated us to get an RV and so that we would have our own home. But remember, we went into this home. And as we were getting in late at night, uh, uh, the couple said, uh, we just want you to know we have a few cats. It's like, Okay. Well, I didn't know by a few he meant in the 20s. We kind of out in a farm area and we go into the home and, and he said, your room is right down the hall up the stairs, right down the hall to the right. We're walking through the kitchen, cats on the kitchen table, cats on the counter. We go into our room and cats were on the bed Went to the bathroom, cats were in the bathtub and in the sink. Now, just in case some of you wonder, that's not the way it's supposed to be. There's nothing normal about that. And if there's anyone here who thinks it's normal, you're, you're crazy. And so there, there's just nothing. We got in bed that night and the, the sheets were wet. We, um, I fasted in the morning. I, did, I just had a sudden impulse to fast as we were going down for breakfast and I was coughing in, sneezing in, breathing in cat hairs and cat hairs blowing out my nose and, and uh, it was no bubbles, there was cat hairs coming out and, and uh, all day long team members pointing out the cat hair on our clothes and, and it was... Um, it was a um, trying time. We um, called up the team members one night. I said, hey, I need some sheets. I'm coming over to where you are. We got over. I went over and knocked on the door, and they 
one of the team members came and let us in and went back to their room. I said, don't say anything. I said, I just need to get some sheets and went in and one of the team members laying on the floor. I said, what's he laying on the floor? They said, they didn't have another bed for us. So we, we decided we'd trade off and one would sleep at the floor, one would sleep the bed on the bed. And this is the way it was for the week. You know, one of us began to um, complain in one of our meals together, just, um, just, just, just talking about it and trying to outdo the other one. And all of a sudden, the verse came to my mind, and our, our code word was 1045. And 1045 was a reminder of Mark 1045. Jesus didn't come to be ministered unto, but to minister, to give his life a ransom for many. I didn't come, Jesus said, so that you can serve me. I came that I might serve you. In fact, he came to seek and to save those whom he can deliver and save. He was on a search for us. There were many a times in those early years, um, I'd go preach by myself and, and I would stay in the nicest of places. I, I just couldn't believe how nice some of these homes were. And then Christy was still working um, there at the bank and she worked for the foreclosure department. Uh, that was at the time Chase Bank went to bank, uh, bank one to Chase Bank. Now it's Truist and, and um um, no, it's from Chase to Bank One. And, and so she'd come and she'd get off and she would join me every so often. Every time she joined me, we stay in one of the worst possible places. And I'd tell her, it's not like this most of the time. It's usually really nice. Another time she came, we were in North Carolina and a pastor's a large church. And I said, I, I'm, I know they'll put us in a decent place. Well, they put us in a home with a, um, it was a military home or near a military base and and so the wife was there with two little kids and her husband was deployed and she was expecting another. And, um, and they said, you're staying in, in, in the middle room. Well, the middle room was actually the dining room. They put a bed in the dining room and there was accordion doors closing both, both, uh, both uh, doorways of that, of that room. So we're staying in this dining room and... Um, and there were two Siamese cats. That was their home. We went to bed that night and we, have you ever heard of Siamese cat? They're eerie. They're devilish. And we we're looking for those cats. They're underneath the bed and, and it became a fight. We won and got them out. And I remember getting back in bed, laying there and, and, uh, I was looking out at the slat of the accordion door. I said, I think I see eyeballs. And I don't think they're the cats. I don't think they can stand that high. And I'm looking and there's eyeballs looking at me and realize, oh, there's some kids standing there looking at us. And so all through the night, I look over and there are eyeballs looking at us. And <laughs> we came home from the service one night, was going into our room, said goodnight and, and uh, went in and and a little boy came in, he was playing in the dirt out there with his Tonka truck and came in, he was covered in dirt and he came running in, he said, let me help you and he ran right into the room and he pulled back the bed sheets and he got underneath our bed and he laid there while I was unpacking. I thought, I don't know which is worse, the little boy's been playing in the dirt with his Tonka truck or the Siamese cats. And sure enough, I thought that and the Siamese cats began to sing to us as well. We went and got some sheets. We didn't say anything to the people of the house. We went and got sheets. And so every night we'd pull those sheets off and we'd put on fresh sheets and we'd sleep on those, get up in the morning, take those sheets off, put theirs back on, fold up ours and put them in, in a bag and, and take them with us. And, and yet the verse would come to mind, 1045, Jesus didn't come to be ministered unto but to minister. What are you living for? Who are you living for? You have a lot in life. This is not what I deserve. This is not what I want. If you're going to fulfill your identity as a servant now so that you can serve as a verb, then there's a few things that must happen. First of all, you must deal with self. Self doesn't serve. 
Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. See, our motivation for investment in ministry should not be what do we get out of it, but our motivation should be how can we contribute to somebody's life. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 15, Paul says, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. C.S. Lewis talks about the vulnerability of love. I've heard people say, I've loved and I've given, I've sacrificed, I've served, and all that's ever happened is my heart's been broken, I've been taken advantage of, and I'm not going to love anymore. Well, C.S. Lewis, he speaks to that. He said, to love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything, and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. You wrap your heart carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable impenetrable, irredeemable, for to love is to be vulnerable. You know, Jesus served. Who did he serve? He served a denier whose name was Peter. He served a doubter whose name was Thomas. He he served deserters. All forsook him, the Bible says. And he served a deceiver, Judas. And he knew every bit of that when he went into it from the beginning. Judas died, went to hell because he wanted the kingdom, but he did not want the king. What uh, condescension for the incarnate Son of God to take the feet of Judas into his holy hands and wash them. Jesus washed the feet of Judas, and a few chapters later, the feet of Jesus, feet wounded because of the sinner, Judas. Let me ask you this question. You know whose feet Jesus washed, but who washed Jesus' feet? When God looks for a man, I've said it before, He looks for nobodies from nowhere with nothing. I'm glad for that. James Stewart, the evangelist, not the actor, primarily in the European countries in the mid-1900s, he preached at Bob Jones in chapel just to give you an idea. It wasn't that very long time ago. But he was primarily in the European countries and he has a book. There's a book about him. I must tell the story of a boy preacher from the age of 14. Every young man ought to get a hold of James Stewart's uh, biography, autobiography of, of a boy preacher from the age of 14. What God did in his heart. But he talked about this matter of needing and longing to have somebody join him and pray for him in his meetings. He called him a a praying evangelist. He said, I need a a praying evangelist to join me because of the, the confrontation of James Stewart's preaching. He would many times, he'd go into college campuses and he'd preach to those in open air meetings. Well, there was a man by the name of Herbert Brown who felt the, the, the leadership of God to join James Stewart. Herbert Brown said to Mr. Stewart, I believe God wants me to accompany you for the ministry of intercession. I want to I be that praying evangelist, one who can pray for you while you preach. James Stewart said, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know, let me pray about it. James Stewart went before God and said, God, I don't think that this is your will. I think Herbert Brown will embarrass you. You see, Herbert Brown had been shell-shocked in the war. He stammered, uh, uh, he, he stammered and he stuttered profusely. He couldn't get out a single sentence without stuttering all over his words. He would even pump his leg as he would try with, with urgency to get out what he was saying. And, and James Stewart said, God, he'll embarrass us. I just don't think that, that this is what you would have him to do. And God dealt with James Stewart. That he wasn't so concerned with the cause of Christ as much as he was concerned about his own cause. 
And so James Stewart yielded to the Lord, told Herbert Brown he could join him. James Stewart said that he would preach, and, and as time went on, he saw tremendous victories in preaching. He was always at a point where he would look for Herbert Brown somewhere in the crowd. Many times again, they're in open air meetings. He said he'd find Herbert Brown off to the side. He'd have his hat off, his eyes closed, and his face facing heavenward. And James Stewart said, I always took great consolation in that. Herbert Brown would always say to Stewart, he said, preacher, you preach, I'll pray, God's going to work. You preach, I'll pray, God's going to work. And Stuart said he did. I'm telling you, if you can get a hold of the books and read of the incredible things that God did. On one occasion, Herbert Brown's, excuse me, James Stewart is preaching. He's preaching to a, a, an open air crowd at a college. And, and the group of atheists heard about the meeting. They were going to the meeting to disrupt James Stewart is preaching on a platform like I'm on and he's preaching to the crowd. The leader of the atheistic crowd, he made his way through that, that uh, uh, large group that was listening and he, he came up to the platform where the evangelist was standing and preaching. The atheistic leader in front of everybody stood there and he drew back his fist to strike the preacher and as soon as he did, God struck him and paralyzed him. And there the atheist was paralyzed for all to see. The evangelist stepped back and they watched him. And after a few moments, God released him. And that atheist retreated into the crowd. And many of those atheists heard the gospel and got saved that night. And that's the testimony James Stewart said to the praying of a Herbert Brown. James Stewart said Herbert Brown came to him on one occasion. And he said, Mr. Stewart, I'd like to ask you to pray for me. He said, would you pray that God would take away my stammering tongue? And James Stewart said to him, Mr. Brown, to be honest with you, I'd rather be able to pray like you pray than to preach like I preach. But I'll pray with you and I'll pray for you. He said, we prayed that God would release him, deliver him from his stammering and his stuttering. He said, God never did. But here's the thing about Herbert Brown, he said. I never heard him speak a sentence without stammering and stuttering when he's talking to people. But James Stewart said, I've heard him pray for hours without ever one time stuttering. And he said, what Herbert Brown prayed for, God gave him. You know why I believe that to be the case? Because God delights to use nobodies from nowhere with nothing. The best backdrop to show the mighty power of God is a nobody from nowhere with nothing. I'm saying we've got to deal with self. Who do I want people to see when they see me? Do I want them to see me? Or do I want them to see the miracle worker? Absolutely confident in the power of proven biblical methodologies rather than a reliance on the unproven trends and novelty. I want people to see God. There are many today that are changing. Churches are changing. We're changing our, our methodology. We're changing our philosophy. And, and a lot of churches are changing. And it's because they've not seen the miracles of God. And when they don't see the miracles of God, they're having to try to figure out, how can I make up for this deficit? Now, I'm not about rejecting something that's new or creative. As much as I am, I want us to maintain that we're going to embrace and we're going to ensure that our methodologies are reinforcing that which is still timeless and unchangeable, that is the Bible. 
Just because the song is new does not mean it's wrong. We, we don't want to reject something that's new or something that is, that is creative, but we do want to be careful not to embrace something that is trendy just for the sake of it being trendy. We have a timeless Bible. We have a timeless institution called the church. And so shouldn't our methodologies reflect the timelessness of our God? It's not simply what you add, but it's what are we replacing? Holding fast, he says in this passage, verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faithfulness of our profession. Holding fast is a commitment to that which is timeless. I'm also not advocating that our church or a group of older preachers simply tell the young preachers what to think either. But if we're going to consider one another in love and provoke one another, it does require that we allow the older preachers to teach and to challenge and to invest and lovingly challenge us as to how to think. I think it's very important. With the rate of change in our culture, if we're not about creating a culture where we're committed to that which is timeless, then by design, we will shift by default. He says, hold fast, hold steadfast in our commitment to biblical process and our confidence that will produce the right product. Holding fast, steadfast commitment that represents a kingdom that is enduring. So with that, methods do matter. Even in this culture of love, it doesn't mean we can't preach the truth. We can preach the truth in love. But we, we, we must maintain a culture that is based upon timeless truth. Paul, he was faced with this in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. He said, I could have come to you in, with excellency of speech, but I didn't. He says, I came not, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 1, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and fear and in much trembling. Listen, verse 4, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Now why? Why was that important? Why did Paul say, I have two ways I can come to you. I can come to you with enticements or I can come to you in the demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. Why did it matter? Why did it matter if a church was leaning more trendy versus timeless? Why did it matter as to what standards they had? Why did it matter, Paul, as to how you came to preach the Bible? After all, it's the Bible. Just give us the Bible. He says, here's why it matters. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You see, Paul said, whichever methodology I use, that's where your faith will lie. If you see that you can build a church based upon trends, based upon consumer-driven tactics, then you're going to put your confidence there as well, Paul said. Listen, I'm all for understanding the trends out there. But don't just look at the trends. We've got to look at the trends behind the trends. In other words, we need to figure out why are they going that way? And then figure out why did Elijah pour water on top of an altar so that it would catch on fire? Because Elijah knew, just like Paul, whichever methodology I use, that's where people's faith will lie. And people could not mistake God did this. And Paul says it does matter. It does matter. And by the way, don't ever confuse a crowd to be the same as a church. A crowd never constitutes a church. And so we do need to embrace the right culture. 
the culture that demonstrates the Spirit's power. The method you depend upon determines where people's confidence will be placed. Let me say this about enticements and trends. It's easier to borrow enticements. I can go to another church and find, this is, this is good methodology here. Not all methodologies are wrong, but we can borrow somebody else's ideas. We can borrow other people's enticements. I, I, we, we want to be welcoming, friendly. We want to be lively. We, we, we can borrow enticements. That's, that's kind of the problem. It's not a sin to borrow ideas and give ideas, but here's my point. You can't borrow God's power from somebody else. That's why we have prayer. I'm not saying we pray as much as we should or could, but I'm saying that's why we at least believe in the idea and concept of prayer. I can't borrow enough enticements to change people's lives. But we can get a hold of the God of all power. And I'm saying that in this culture that we're talking about, it's a culture that is motivated by timeless truth, a culture that is motivated by fulfilling my identity as a servant so that I can fulfill the activity that I've been called to do, and that's to serve. And it's a culture of considering one another that's motivated, look at verse 25, by the coming of Jesus. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, I didn't give this to you in great outline form, so let me give you the three thoughts I gave just now. Number one, a culture of considering one another is only as effective as your intimacy with God. Number two, a culture of considering one another is wrapped up in my identity. I am a servant, so therefore I ought to serve. And number three, a culture of considering one another is motivated by the coming of Jesus. There should be an urgency. Peter talked about it this morning. So much the more, so much the more as we see the day approaching. Let's stand together, please.